I'd like to introduce to you uh, Dr. William Blackstock from Wake Forest, who's going to give us a talk on radiation oncology. I'd also like to let all of you know that he is the recipient of our Tree of Life Award this year for our foundation. So congratulations, uh, Dr. Blackstock. And thank you. So before I start, you know, James Watson is an interesting fellow. He's won a Nobel, he's made contributions, but he's also said a number of racially charged things. And it turns out, when he had his DNA checked, he's probably more African American than I am. <laughs> um, so I'm really gonna give a talk that's sort of general, but I am gonna talk specifics in terms of where I think radiation fits for stomach cancer. I'm not gonna talk about patients with advanced stage disease or stage four disease. I'm actually gonna talk about adjuvant. So these are folks with earlier stage disease where they go and get a resection, and then we have conversations as to what else those patients might benefit from. And again, I'm a radiation oncologist at Wake Forest. I still spend some time at UNC Chapel Hill where I trained um, and focus on GI cancers. I don't have anything relevant to disclose. <laughs> when I became chair of the Conflict of Interest Committee at Wake Forest, I had to stop doing that sort of thing. It, it, it wouldn't work. So gastric cancer is a, is a surgical disease. Again, early stage gastric or even advanced, locally advanced gastric is a surgical disease and, and, it's, and it still is a surgical disease. And nothing I'm gonna to say today is gonna to change that. But as you can imagine, just from this picture or an image of, of, of the stomach, you can see there's diffuse lymphatics around the stomach. There's you know, lymph nodes everywhere. And you can imagine that even with the best surgical resection, the most detailed surgical resection, then it may be difficult to clear all microscopic disease just because of the lymphatics associated with gastric cancers. And so this is a radiation portal. It's, it's, it's a very old looking radiation portal. Uh, but the reason I'm transitioning in that is, well then what can we do locally to improve our ability to control this disease? Uh, we, we know with surgery alone there's going to be some local failures in those patients because there are residual disease or, left, or microscopic disease left behind. And one strategy would be to use radiotherapy to come in and hopefully clear any microscopic disease that may still be remaining. The challenge of radiation in this field is just that. As you can see, depending on where in the stomach the tumor is located, the lymphatic drainage is different and the lymphatic risk is different. And so, and I've listed a different, you know, nodal site, celiac, SMA, port hepatitis. Doesn't really matter what I'm specifically speaking to as much as it matters. Those lymph nodes can be in risk. And then how do you bring radiation into this so, so that it's done safely and done in an effective way? And trust me, it's, it's challenging. And what you're looking at is, uh, I hope I'll get you oriented, the kidneys are in yellow. Um, you can see that the lungs are up above, and then where you see the opening sort of between the dotted, the, the, the hash marks, is where the radiation would be delivered. But again, depending on where in the stomach that the tumor was resected from, different lymph nodes are at risk. So you really have to be thoughtful in terms of how you design a radiation portal. Now this is, a, again, a very dated image in the sense that we are doing more sophisticated radiotherapy planning. Again, words that don't really matter, but intensity modulated radiotherapy is something we're doing. Uh, you know, there's other ways to do this better and more effectively, but still there is the challenge of if you think you have a risk of a local recurrence or resist persistent disease, how do you deliver a radiotherapy to that patient in a safe and effective way? So I would love to tell you we've done better than this because this paper is pretty old. Oh. 2001, but unfortunately I can't show you anything now that tells you that this isn't still relevant. We still follow the guidelines from McDonald's study that was published in 2001. I'm disappointed to tell you that, but that's the, that's the nature of this. So this was the largest study performed in the United States that really wanted to ask the question, do you need to add anything after surgery for patients with resected gastric cancers? And in this trial, patients were either observed, so they had their resection, or well, they were randomized to radiation plus chemotherapy and the drug was, was five floor a year or so. The largest study that's ever been tested, that tested this question in the United States. And if, you're, if you didn't notice, Jaffer Johnny is on that list of uh, authors, so Jaffer was involved in this study. I was too young. <laughs> and this is the result. Uh, as you can see, and I'm looking at the, the box at the bottom, if you look at median overall survival, the average survival for those folks who had surgery alone it was about 27 months, a little over two years, but you could push it out to three years for those folks that actually had surgery plus the adjuvant radiation and chemotherapy. And then the RFS is risk-free survival, and essentially there was you know, an improvement there as well. So this was an important pivotal study in the United States that said the standard of care for patients with resected gastric cancer or stomach cancer should be surgery followed by radiation and chemotherapy. This became our new standard of care.
So where do I think we're going in the future? I think this is where we're going to go in the future. I'm not going to talk about this too much, David. I know you're going to be talking probably about the TOGA study with Herceptin, but that was probably the next most pivotal study that's been published recently. And then the TOGA study looked at the addition of Herceptin to standard chemotherapy for patients with advanced cancer. So these are folks who had metastatic disease at presentation. And in that study, the survival was increased from 16 months for those folks who overexpressed from 11 months. So that was a substantial increase. And now we have a regimen of chemotherapy and, and with Herceptin that had a response rate that was closer to 50%. So now we have a drug regimen that actually is looking at, that, that is very active, at least in my opinion. And I think the next step is the study that I'm showing you here, which is a study that's going to try to look at bringing that same regimen to patients who have earlier stage disease. These are folks who have resections, who then go on to get radiation and chemotherapy. Certainly you have to look at HER2 new overexpression to see if they're overexpressing, and then bring that Herceptin into the earlier stage patients. And I think we're going to find, hopefully, that we're going to see benefits of the magnitude we saw for patients who had advanced disease. So two things before I, before I sit down, I guess, is, and, and, and one of them is I'm so happy to be involved with, with Deb and her, and her group. I mentioned this last night at dinner. This group actually gets things done. The ACR you know, award that I was involved in with uh, the UNC person was a fantastic thing to see happen, and that only happened because of the folks in this room pushed those things to happen. Advocacy day for gastric cancer, that's a wonderful thing. So uh, you know, the time I spend with this organization tells me I'm getting things done because I see the things they get done. So congratulations to you guys. The second piece of it is my daughter told me about a week ago I've got to be back home this evening for her prom picture-taking ceremony. And um, so I will send Libby images later today of me and my daughter and the boy I call Knucklehead uh, at, um, at, the, um, at the prom picture-taking event. So I will miss the gala tonight, which is horrible for me. I'm all done. Thanks. Thank you so much, William. Um, are there any questions from the audience here? I'm sure there are questions. Uh, you know, we talk a lot about chemotherapy and targeted agents, uh, um, but uh, you know, does anybody have any questions in regards to radiation therapy for stomach cancer? Okay, so we, I have a question online here, really quick. It says, what is your view on the McDonald 10-year follow-up paper that indicated radiation was not better than surgery, only for diffuse type gastric cancer? And, I, yeah, I don't want to <laughs> <I don't> <laughs> get too complicated. That's, that was a subset analysis looking at some histologic differences, and I think that's sort of a stretch to take that data set and then do a subgroup and then come up with something that's definitive or conclusive. So, you know, I don't want to get into an argument on the internet with anybody, but I still do the McDonald. I still think that remains standard of care. Okay, we have a question in the audience here, in the front. Yeah. And then uh, we have okay. one over there. I, I just wanted, I wanted to know if you're using any complementary therapies with your radiotherapy. Uh, my organization has gathered evidence-based information on natural things that help reduce the toxicity to the rest of the body. I, human in particular, acupuncture as well. My approach to gastric cancer, because it is such a serious diagnosis, Deb mentioned when she got up that, you know, we are not doing that well with this cancer. So when a patient comes to me and requests knowledge or information around alternative therapies, I have a woman in Carboro, North Carolina, who I refer them to. I have a phone number. I can't think of her name, which I probably shouldn't do anyway. But I certainly will refer folks to her because I don't have the information. I don't have that information to, to share because I don't know that world, but I certainly don't discourage it. I just make sure they go to folks that I think are going to be there professionally for them, if that makes sense. We have a question here in the front and the next one in the back. Yes, doctor, could you uh, com compare and contrast, if you would, the McDonald study from the so-called MAGIC study, which is a uh, all chemo surgery chemo yeah. without radiation? Are there pros yeah. and cons? There are pros and cons. So, you know, Dave, you and I can go at it maybe because <laughs> I'm thinking he's more of a magic guy. I'm more of a McDonald guy. Um, so the magic study, and Dave, I think I'm correct on this, was it was a study that randomized patients to, as you said, chemotherapy, then you went to surgery, and then you received additional chemotherapy. The difference in the McDonald trial to that study is that, and it was done in Europe, those folks knew they were going to go to surgery before they started the trial. Or they knew they were going to get the chemotherapy and then surgery, they were randomized at the very beginning of all that. The patients in the McDonald's study, maybe I'll say it the other way, which might make more sense. Those patients had their surgeries, 
and then they were randomized after the surgery. So lots of folks in the McDonald's study got surgery that we would probably describe as not quite adequate to be, to be kind, whereas the surgery in the European study, the MAGIC trial, was very well controlled. Those surgeons knew those patients were coming. There was some expectation for lymph node dissections. I hope that word means something to you. So there are different type population of patients to me. The bigger issue, and again, Ilson and I can debate it, is we can't do that study in the United States, in my opinion. There's not that many folks that have resected gastric cancers anyway. If you start trying to tell surgeons, you know, up front we're going to randomize folks to chemotherapy, then that means anybody that had surgery before they saw the medical oncologist wouldn't go on that study. So the population of patients gets smaller and smaller. Does that make sense, what I just said? So we really, it would take us a decade to do that study in this, in this country because, again, surgeons do their surgery and then they send them. I think I'm accurate on that. Yeah. Well, well, I think the, the McDonald's study is sort of reflective of a patient population and community practice. Um, and, um, and we don't actually even use the McDonald regimen anymore. We use oral 5-FU and so, because actually the McDonald schedule is pretty toxic. So really nobody uses that anymore. We use uh, mostly capecitabine or infusional 5-FU. And clearly it's a positive study at long-term follow-up. But the major problem is only about 20% of the patients on the study had really good surgery. You know, that they had really good lymph node dissections. And many criticize the McDonald study and say, well, the radiation just made up for really suboptimal surgery because the biggest impact of radiation was to reduce local recurrences. Uh, and um, so that's a major criticism. Uh, the MAGIC trial also didn't have the best quality surgery, but in that surgery, about 40, 45 percent had pretty good surgery. And you saw a similar benefit of chemotherapy alone, even without radiation. So, so I think uh, for you know, a community-based uh, approach where the patient maybe isn't getting uh, the kind of lymph node dissection that, that a high volume surgeon would, uh, would do, uh, the McDonald approach is appropriate in a patient that has uh, probably what we call less than a D1 resection. Uh, perioperative chemotherapy uh, is catching on in the US. Uh, it's the predominant approach in Europe. Uh, and there are ongoing trials uh, in Europe and in, um, uh, um, in Asia uh, looking at chemotherapy alone with or without radiation to really address the question in a study, does adding radiation add benefit? Uh, there's at least one Korean study uh, that did show a small additional, even in patients that got very good surgery, if you gave those patients radiation in addition to chemotherapy, you got a small additional benefit. So, so I think decisions about whether or not to give radiation need to be made on the quality of the surgery performed, uh, the extent of lymph node involvement, uh, and uh, it's really an unresolved question, uh, but uh, certainly chemotherapy at a minimum should be given uh, as an adjuvant, and whether or not to add radiation, there are other factors, including the quality of the surgery, number of lymph nodes taken uh, to say whether or not that patient would, would really benefit from radiation. It's still an open question. Great. Just as a, just as an intro, I know there's these uh, different terminologies being thrown around, and just for clarification, uh, the word adjuvant means to get chemotherapy after your surgery. There's perioperative means also getting chemotherapy before and after surgery. So if uh, anybody has any questions on any of the terminology, please feel free to ask any questions. In, in the back of the room, we have a question. Um, yes, I do. Um, Please correct me if I'm wrong, but I read somewhere where you can have a combination of the uh, radiation with surgery, and I believe that they said it was like layering, sandwiching, and it's being done at John Hopkins. Is that something that is well, part of this procedure? You know, Jaffa, I'd actually throw this to Jaffa because MD Anderson a few years ago really was advocate, advocating chemoradiation, well, actually chemotherapy and chemoradiation, then surgery. So they were actually putting the, the, th the adjuvant treatments up front. Um, a lot of people have adopted that approach. We haven't adopted it in my institution. Uh, I worry, and I'll just be honest with you, and Jeff, he would, you know, again, if he were here, oh, is he here? Oh, he's, yeah, he's coming up, so yeah, I'm getting in trouble. But, um, <laughs> you know, the worry I always have is that you have to get these folks to surgical resections at some point, and you don't really want to have that compromised if, again, you're doing something that may d delay that or, or, or interfere with that. But it's certainly a strategy. We have a question over here on the... Hi, yes. Yes, it's here. Okay, hi. Um, I'm a first year medical student and I'm interested in the field of interventional radiology and I would just like to get your opinion on how you see oncology, interventional radiology as a field improving the delivery of chemotherapy or even its effects. 
Okay, that's a, that's a loaded question. Um, um, I think interventional radiology is going to expand in terms of, of its portfolio of, of options for patients. I can tell you just in the last five to ten years, uh, we have patients who are all going for, uh, you know, Local procedures, I don't even want to define one because there's so many local procedures that interventional does. I think what really has to happen for interventional, though, is there has to be a component of oncology that comes into that training because I think the, the, the downside to IR before, interventional radiology before, was they had all these really cool procedures that were nice local procedures, but there was not always the oncology piece to sort of know where that, that procedure would fit. I think now, I've, I've worked with a guy now who actually is very much oncology driven in his thought process, and we work very well together in terms of well, what patient will benefit from an SBRT radiation strategy or somebody that's going to maybe benefit from chemoembolization, uh, and, and we, can, we can have those conversations. I think there was one more here. In the front row. Can a patient who has not tested positive for the eight, uh, HER2, can that change in that same patient? I'm going to answer that, and then I'm going to let Ilson answer that too. I think so. I always wonder that if a patient gets a resection up front, and let's say they do test them for her septin or her two, and they're negative, and let's just say unfortunately their cancer comes back two years, three years later, I would like to think you probably should retest that recurrence because I think tumors evolve over time, and what might have been her negative up front may become her positive when it comes back. I don't know, Dave, how you feel? Yeah, the, the best literature is from breast cancer, and there's about, it's about a 10 or 15 percent discordant, so it's not very large. Um, so uh, if we have more tissue, we always will look again, but the likelihood that somebody's going to change their status is pretty low. Um, <clears throat> I would just add, I think that's an important uh, question now for research. I think there's a lot of interest now in what we call the tumors being heterogeneous, meaning that if you look across individual cancers, um, there's actually variations within the tumor in terms of the genes that are altered. And um, uh, there's been some very nice studies, primarily in kidney cancer, where you take a tumor and look at a bunch of different pieces, and, um, and often the, you know, the, there are, there's local variation. And I think, you know, I think it's important to figure out um, um, <clears throat> how that variation might impact uh, uh, clinical practice, and also if you have people undergo <coughs> therapy and then something emerges over time, you've also added sort of like a uh, kind of a <coughs> bottleneck to that process where you're putting on <coughs> selective pressure. So you could imagine, for example, if you had a patient who was getting, has a mix of tumors that are HER2 positive and HER2 negative, and then they get a HER2 inhibitor that over time, if there's a small part of the tumor that's HER2 negative, that might have an advantage over time, and then what would grow out later would be the HER2 negative part. But I think it's an important research question, and I think that a lot of um, work now is trying to understand things within the patient, both how the tumor is heterogeneous, and also maybe if the, the original tumor and the metastasis, how those are the same or different. I think those are very important questions moving forward. So I can personally, I'll tell you what I would do. I would have my recurrence tested because to me, even if it's a 10 or 15% discordance, if you are HER2 overexpressor, to me that, that, that benefit with Herceptin is real. That's a real difference and I would have to make sure that I wasn't an overexpressor. I have stage uh, four is what they say, stomach and colon, and it's in the lining. Even colonoscopies didn't show anything because it was in the lining. And um, it came back as a minus one or something like that. I don't understand it, but my HER2 was a minus. It wasn't even zero. And, but they took like 43 biopsies. And that you know, said it was throughout the lining. So my doctor is saying it, you know, it won't, probably won't change at all. You know, it, won't get, it won't go on the positive side. I've had 12 rounds of chemo. The full fox, is that what you call it? I got my daughter here. She's my. Yeah, you, got, you got it right. <laughs> but um, but I, mean, I had 12 rounds of that uh, in January, it stopped. And tomorrow, or Monday morning, I go for another PET scan. So I haven't had chemo for three months, two months, January. And I went from 170 pounds to 137, and now I'm back up from 137 to 170. Mm. So, but anyway. 
You know, you pray look for great. me for my PET scan. <laughs> but my oncologist, uh, he's saying that you know it probably won't change, but I'm praying that it can change, and that it does, and that I could use as an option. So. Hmm. It sounds like it would be encouraged to at least be tested again for it. You know, the other conversation that was had before was really about some of the other compounds that are coming down the pipe. So I think at some point there's going to be more options other than Herceptin. I really think yep. that's going to happen soon. Yep. Okay, any more questions? We have one question in the back. Dr. Blackstock, I know that your talk was uh, aimed at uh, early stage gastric cancer. So Debbie has just finished the first week of a five-week regimen of radiation plus Herceptin plus chemotherapy, uh, but she has stage four uh, with a recurrence. Can, I know this would be a whole new talk, but could you comment on the use of radiation for advanced stage metastatic Well, you know, Debbie's cancer. a miracle, so it's hard to... I know. I can't talk about specifics because... She's a miracle. Um, but clearly to me, if you have stage four disease that's under control, and I don't want to get into too much, you know, I know a little bit about Debbie's situation. Uh, there, is, there is some reason to think if you do have a local recurrence, they're going back and trying to do something local makes sense. And I have, we've talked a little bit. I think the approach that, that they're taking is absolutely appropriate. It's not often that it happens though, unfortunately. Um, it's just not a common sort of thing. But it's absolutely reasonable. I think they're doing the right thing. It's what I would do. <laughs> All right, guys, Great. I got off to the prom. So <laughs> thank you so much, William, and safe travels to you.